Welcome to another edition of RCE. Again, this is Brock Palin. You can find us online at rce-cast.com. You can find our old shows there, subscribe by RSS, iTunes, etc. Uh, you can also follow me on Twitter, where actually I've been kind of active recently, been mentioning some things, and we have a lot of upcoming events. So uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Brock Palin, all one word. And again, I have Jeff Squires from Cisco Systems and one of the authors of Open MPI. And Jeff, you just got back from another MPI forum meeting, so I assume the next revision of MPI is cooking along. It's coming. There's a, there's a boff at Supercomputing about MPI 3.0. We're looking to be done with MPI 3.0 by next Supercomputing. And that is, date is tentative, um, but that's, that's the goal we're shooting for. And there's a bunch of interesting things coming in there. And the biggest fight right now is about C++, which is <laughs> really interesting and I feel responsible for because I created the C++ bindings back in 1996. Um, but yes, anyway, the intermachinations of the MPI forum. But come to the, uh, the BOF at Supercomputing and hear all about that. And speaking of BOFs, I have my own BOF as well with George Basilica from the University of Tennessee about the State of the Union for Open MPI. And, and thankfully, the uh, Supercomputing organizers did not put us opposite the, uh, the MPI CH BOF. Um, this year, last year they did. It was kind of disappointing because so you couldn't go to both. And I like to hear what those guys have to say too. So I think they're on Monday and we're on Tuesday, or they're on Tuesday and we're on Wednesday, or something, something, something like that. Yeah, and I'll also be at SC. I'll be floating around. I'm not doing any speaking at SC, but I'll be there the entire week. Also, I have coming up at, uh, at my home institution, University of Michigan, right here in Ann Arbor, we have a Cyber Infrastructure Days coming up. Just a couple of days, the 29th through the 1st, uh, November and December. Uh, and I'll actually be speaking there on Exceed, which is the follow-on to TerraGrid with Phil Blood from Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center. Cool. Uh, I'll also be giving some other tutorials on compiler tips and stuff like that for the average researcher so yeah i saw you you advertised something about you did some mpi tutorial or something uh, recently. A, a very very basic one it's, it's the one i asked if 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 you wanted to come and do but it's, it's very basic because <laughs> then i found out they only gave me an, a 90 minutes to do it in like r really really yeah okay. yeah <laughs> not not i couldn't justify the travel for 90 minutes for 90 minutes yeah <laughs> yeah. yeah so uh, yeah i'll be i'll be speaking on that too and the uh, other other random stuff focused towards people okay. who are actually getting their hands dirty. So, hey, well, and one throwback to to supercomputing too. We gotta we feel like we need to mention the student cluster competition because that was just so awesome last year that we were a part of it, and uh, the energy and the excitement around that. You need to go stop by and see all the students. I think they're on the floor this year or right adjacent. I'm not sure exactly where they are, but you need to go see them and talk to them because it was really really very cool last year. Yeah, no, that was that was a great thing last year, and I think you know Doug and those guys have been putting a lot of neat stuff together with teams and stuff this year. So I'm excited to see what actually I need I need to look up what the challenges are this year, what the applications are. I'm curious. All right, I'll throw out one last thing too. Also, my blog and uh, my Twitter on there. Brock's been more active on Twitter than I have recently, but I've been answering a bunch of uh, MPI related questions on my blog recently. So if you have any questions about how MPI works or why we do the things the way we do or anything about the forum or the standard, please feel free to let me know, either an email or Twitter, and uh, I'll write up a blog post about it. So with that, I think our, our pre-show extravaganza is done. Brock, you want to introduce our, our guest for today? <laughs> yes. Yes. Our, our guest today comes from DreamHost. Uh, his name is Sage uh, Weil, and he's actually the, the – I believe he actually started the Ceph uh, Distributed File System project. So, Sage, why don't you take a moment to introduce yourself? Um, sure. Yeah, my name is Sage Weil. Um, <clears throat> I did my graduate work at the University of California, Santa Cruz, where um, my thesis was on the distributed storage. Um, and out of that grew the, the Ceph Distributed File System. Um, and since finishing, I've sort of continued working on that project to make it a viable open source solution to the scalability and reliability issues that people have for HPC type, HPC type storage um, and enterprise for that matter. So Ceph basically built out of this work you did before, there wasn't encouragement from somebody else or is this something you fully decided on your own you were going to go do? It, it, it grew out of um, the tri-labs, the Sedendia, Livermore and Los Alamos, um, a series of grants they made um, to Santa Cruz to look at scalable petascale object-based storage system. Um, and so there's some initial research there um, dealing with uh, low-level object file systems and placement algorithms. 
Um, but when I joined the project, uh, I was focusing on distributed metadata and sort of how to deal with that issue. At the time, um, Livermore in particular was just starting to use Lustre, um, and they were having a lot of pain with the uh, lack of scalability in the metadata server, and so that was sort of a key motivation for that work. Um, but sort of out of that whole, I know I started with metadata, but as a result, we sort of ended up building the rest of the system, um, including a scalable, reliable object storage layer um, and uh, improved placement policy and so forth. So what exactly is object storage as, as, composed, uh, as compared to, say, you know, quote-unquote normal storage? Um, I think traditional systems typically talk about storage in terms of blocks. So you'd have like um, either on a single disk, it's block number, some large number, um, or in a, I guess, a sand file system, you'd talk about block offsets within a LUN or something like that. Um, in contrast, the idea with object-based storage is that um, you you name, in the same way that you name a block by numbering it, you would name the object, but it isn't necessarily a number, and it doesn't have a fixed size. So the object can be small or large, and you can have some metadata associated with it as well. And it, it, essentially, the, the, the sort of the key idea is that um, while traditionally file systems are um, have to pay attention to data layout and placement and block allocation and you know which sectors on the disk are storing what data, um, using an object-based interface lets you push all of that complexity into the lowest levels of the system where it's more or less hidden and all the distributed, clustered, whatever, the higher levels of the file system don't really have to worry about those details and it simplifies things greatly. So does that mean Ceph, as much as it's a, a file system and a, a driver to be able to write and read and write to it, does it actually live on top of like something else that actually deals with the actual 4K blocks going on disk? Exactly, yeah. So um, normally we, we put our Ceph, um, OSDs we call them, although it has nothing to do with this SCSI T10 OSDs. Um, it's a sort of a poor choice of name. Um, but the, basically the Ceph storage servers um, that manage the, the objects sit on top of a, normally a Butterfest file system. And then that man, where they actually show up is just files. And so the sort of the low-level file system on each of those nodes handles all those details. Um, you can also run it on XFS or ext 4 or whatever else, but that's the that's basic idea. Um, and then Ceph itself only has to worry about, you know, what's in the objects and where in the cluster are they located. I mean, it doesn't have to care about rewriting a B-tree implementation to track free space or whatever. Now, you threw out a bunch of alphabet soup there. Can you uh, decrypt <laughs> some of those things there? So you said things like T10 and, and whatnot. What, what are some of these things for people who aren't familiar with uh, file systems and whatnot? Um, well, I, I hesitate a little bit to talk about T10 because it's sort of a, a red herring. But essentially, there is, a, there is a push maybe five or ten years ago to have this idea of an object disk that basically encapsulates, encapsulates this idea of pushing the details of block allocation into the device. And the original vision was that you would actually buy a hard drive that you would store objects on. And the, the protocol, you wouldn't, you wouldn't say store this block, this data in this fixed size block, but you'd actually name the objects and so forth. Um, that, there's a spec that came out of that, um, and it never really took off. Um, and so now when people talk about OSDs or object disks, usually that's what they think about, but in reality they don't actually exist <laughs> in the real world uh, for the most part. There are some people that sort of approximate that specification in their products, but Nobody actually sells devices. Um, so in contrast to that, Ceph is something completely different. So it basically, it, the idea is that you just take the, the basic idea of pushing the details of block allocation into the storage nodes um, and the lowest sort of layers of the system as possible. Um, and then you can sort of focus on the hard problems of making it scale and distribute it and make it reliable and so forth. So I think you already kind of answered this question a little bit, but let's get it explicitly. There's already a couple of uh, free license parallel file systems out there, you know, Lustre, PVFS2. Oh, why go in the complete direction of building a completely new implementation rather than just putting, contributing distributed metadata to Lustre? Um, the real, I think the real difference is that um, the systems aren't really designed with fault tolerance in mind. Um, whereas sort of when we were at the drawing board with Ceph, um, this, we sort of realized that in order to build something that's going to scale to um, hundreds or thousands of nodes or more, that you really have to design for failure from the, from the beginning. Um, and those systems tend to be constructed on um, the idea that your, your storage nodes are reliable in some way. So they rely on, you know, a SAN backend and failover and dual paths and so forth, which means that you have to have expensive hardware.